on the Amigi here, Mr. Felipe Omar has built out a, an incredible spot that I don't care if it is 18 hours for me to get here plus a day or two, it has been an incredible journey. Well, and you just got started, it's true, you got a taste of what the surf is like, but uh, now that you've kind of walk the reef and got comfortable with the with the spot we should have a lot more fun the next time we go out which will hopefully be tomorrow morning i'm very looking forward to the training and the workout felipe is a very good example for me a good example for surfers in the future that this big wave rider felipe his body, his temple, he has maintained, and it's a, it's a sight to be seen. And he's a happy guy. How much happier can you get when you've, you've created this out of nothing, out of a little jungle that we... But Felipe's had some very, very uh, interesting times in his uh, surfing career, of surfing with some of the very best surfers in the world, and, uh, and has always kept up with them. Now, I also heard that they gave you, awarded you a surf shirt from here in Bali on one of the biggest days. You were the only one that caught. Now, this was a story I got on the way over here that somebody gave you that they had a party that night and that they, mm -hmm. uh, that they gave you a shirt that uh, said that you had ridden the biggest wave. Okay, now I know what that's about. There was a group of Australians here making a movie, I think it was two years ago. And, uh, you know, they had traveled to a number of places and they had decided that whoever caught the biggest wave during the making of the movie would get. not the biggest wave but the most exciting time that you uh, wrote down in that surfing uh, in the surfing journal that uh, my brother Jim had given us was uh, when you had a huge earthquake in Peru and so you were on land at first when the first this earthquake came in and it and you you had your surfboards with you or what was the what was the story my good buddy PD Block who taught me how to surf many years previous. And I were getting ready to go surfing. We had our wetsuits on, we had our surfboards under our arm. We were, you know, 20 feet from the ocean. And all of a sudden my friend Petey starts screaming. I've known this guy for 20 years. I've never seen him get excited about anything. He's a race car driver and he's screaming at the top of his lungs. So I'm staring at him, you know, because I don't care what else is going on. I can't believe that he's screaming. <laughs> and while I'm looking at him, 
I hear this sound, which is like nothing I've ever heard in my life. And now, you know, hearing the sound, I look towards where he was pointing, and I see this island that goes out to sea, the island is moving, and these people that are standing on it are doing some kind of a strange dance, you know, because they're trying not to fall down. <laughs> Uh, the next thing I know, my friend Petey takes off running. And it's only him and I, we're the only two people there. Because this is off season in a little summer town, but it's in winter time. So once he takes off running that, you know, he takes off running and I'm with him. So I start running off behind them. But then I stop and I say, where are you running to? You know, it's an earthquake. The first thing I do is I think, how do people get killed in earthquakes? And I say, well, okay, buildings fall on you. You know, so I look around me and fortunately there were no high-rise buildings. So then I say, okay, how else do people get hurt in earthquakes? And I've seen movies where the ground opens up. So I figure, okay, I'll hold on to my surfboard. That way if the ground opens up, I can bridge it. And I keep telling myself, you know, relax, it's just an earthquake. Uh, at some point, you know, I look around me and I see all these walls. There's no high rises, but there's a lot of walls because in this part of Peru, people normally wall their property. So, you know, there's walls all over the place and the walls are going like this. And pretty soon a lot of walls start going like this and then they're falling on the ground. And when walls fall on the ground, these big clouds of dust go up in the air. And I'm looking at all of this and I'm thinking, okay, you know, just relax, it's an earthquake, it'll be over soon. And the ground keeps shaking and things keep falling and I keep telling myself it'll be over soon. And it's not ending, you know, so pretty soon I'm wondering, is this going to end pretty soon or, or what's happening? Anyway, after some time goes on, I'm convinced that it's the end of the world, okay, because it's not stopping, everything is falling. And when I'm totally sure it's the end of the world, it finally does stop. So, you know, I decide I go look for my friend. I find him standing in the middle of the street. And I, I said, well, you know, where did you run off to? I mean, you had an earthquake. Where are you Come running on. to? And he said, no, when I was young, they always told me that in an earthquake, you got to stand in either a doorway or in the middle of the street. So I ran to the middle of the street. So I said, okay. So anyway, we talked about this experience, which was, a, you know, it was an amazing experience because the earthquake measured at 7.4 on the Raker scale, and it lasted over two minutes. So, you know, it was, it was very strong and very unusual. So we talked about it, and at some point, PD tells me we can't go to Lima. Lima was the city, you know, close by, and I said, well, why can't we go to Lima? There's many earthquakes every year. And then every 20 or 30 years, there's a really strong earthquake, and they actually have different names. An earthquake is called a temblor, and then a terremoto is a humongous earthquake. And so, you know, they got different names for it. So anyway, my friend Pity tells me, we can't go to Lima because in the terremoto of 1948 or 38 or whenever it was, he said there were fires everywhere and Lima was destroyed. So I said, okay, well, you know, I guess we can't go to Lima. And so we talked a little more and then he said, well, what should we do? And I said, you know, I didn't think about it much. I mean, we had our wetsuits, we had our surfboards. I half jokingly said, let's go surfing. I was pretty sure he was gonna say, oh, you're nuts, you know, we can't go surfing. <laughs> <laughs> but instead, he said, okay. And when he said, okay, you know, I thought about it, I said, wow, I mean, that humongous earthquake is probably going to generate some big waves, and my friend is willing to go out with me. I said, wow, you know, I said, okay, let's go to Herradura. Herradura is this point that goes out, way out to sea. You know, if you ever wanted to go out somewhere and get some really big waves, that would be a place to go. Is that a, which, which way does it break, right or left? That's a left. But you know, that was, that was the point that sticks way out. So I said, let's go to Herradura. And he said, no, we can't go to Herradura. 
So I said, well, why can't we go to Herradura? He said, because to get there, we have to drive along this mountain road and all these boulders will have fallen and the road will be impassable. Since the guy race, drives race cars, you know, he knows about this kind of stuff. So I said, okay, we can't go to Herradura. Let's just go out right here. And he said, fine. So, you know, we paddled out. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, if anything really weird happens, we can always climb on the island because there's this island right next to the surfing spot which goes out about half a mile or something. So, you know, I'm thinking, okay, you know, just in case if things get weird, we can jump on the island. But then I didn't think about it anymore. Paddled out. And shortly thereafter, my friend paddles up to me and he says, I want to go in. And I say, why do you want to go in? And he says, well, this little wave just held me down longer than I've ever been held in my life. And this guy has surfed Hawaii, he surfed big waves, you know. And he says, this little wave just held me down so long. Uh, it's, it's, you know, very unusual. Uh, I'd rather go in. So I say, okay, you know, let's catch a wave and go in. So he says, okay. And next thing we're sitting there and he says, Felipe, there's a strong current pulling us out to sea. So, you know, I immediately thought, uh-oh, okay, you know, let's go in right now. So I'm paddling towards shore, and all of a sudden, you know, I look sideways, and there's this island next to me, and I realize that I'm paddling towards shore, but I'm going out to sea backwards. So I say, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, I mean, something's wrong here. What's wrong with this picture? So now I start paddling as hard as I can, and I don't want to look because I know that if I'm going backwards now, I got, I, you know, I'm in real trouble because, I mean, I'm paddling as hard as I can. Yeah, right. I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, going the wrong way. So I, I try not to look, but eventually I, I turn and I look and I'm going backwards so fast that there was nothing that I could possibly do. So I just sat up on my board and started doing some deep breathing. And... Uh, as it turns out, I looked towards the island and my idea of climbing up the, the island was worthless because we were going out way too fast and the island had kind of a cliffy, rocky thing. So even if I could have got to it, I couldn't have climbed anywhere. So next thing I know, we're out, you know, we're out beyond the island, so we're a mile out at sea. And there's this whirlpools coming off the bottom a mile out at sea, which of course, you know, is freaky. And there's these chops that are, you know, six feet high or bigger, and they're coming from every direction, which is, again, freaking me out because normally the chop have a certain pattern and, you know, they're a foot high or something. These chop are six times bigger and they're coming at you from every direction and there's this whirlpool coming off the bottom. So it was like Did the, you get near those whirlpools at all? I mean, could you feel well, them like sucking you, to, you know? You could feel them, but you know, they weren't really, let me see, they were more like huge boils. Okay. Okay. But I mean, a mile out at sea, you don't see huge boils. Right. Yeah, you could feel them, but they weren't sucking you down. But you know, there was the water was just doing weird stuff. So. Okay. <laughs> you remember me telling you that I have a difficult time uh, assessing the size of waves? Right. Okay, if those waves you saw, those chops were two or three feet, then the chop that were down there were, you know, eight or ten feet chop. I mean, they were right. big chops, you know, coming at you in every direction. And basically, you had the feeling that the ocean had gone crazy. And, you know, it was doing stuff that you've never seen it do. Very good. So we're about a mile out at sea. The ocean is doing things I've never seen it do before. I'm very concerned about what's going on. I'm trying to figure it out, you know, trying to figure out what's coming next so I can be prepared. To the best of my ability to figure it out, one of two things had happened. Either the ocean floor had broken open and the ocean was getting sucked in, and I decided I didn't want to think about that anymore, or there was a tsunami on its way, because I had read some articles about tsunamis in Indonesia that had been caused by earthquakes or volcanoes and had been measured at 200 feet, you know, by wiping out all of the trees on those 
mountain side of an island. Right, right. So max is going to be 200 feet. Right. And so in trying to figure what, set a record. what was probably happening, I figured whatever was coming was going to be bigger than anything I had ever seen because the earthquake was bigger than anything I had ever seen. So I figured, you know, there's probably going to be waves ranging from 20 foot Hawaiian, which is like, you know, 30 or 40 foot faces to 100 or 200 feet in size. And so then I had to make a decision, okay, what is the best thing to do if there is a huge wave coming at you? And my choices were one of two things, either keep paddling out to sea, and I didn't want to do that for a number of reasons, or try to cross this bay, which, you know, is about a mile from one side to the other. And if we manage to cross it, on the other side of the bay, there's a wave that used to be the big wave spot in Peru. We call it Contiki. And if we could cross the bay and get to Contiki and pick up a wave there, that wave would carry you at least halfway, maybe three quarters of the way to the beach. And at that point, I wanted to get to the beach as soon as possible because I didn't want to deal with this tsunami. What, you know, I didn't know how big it was, but it was probably going to be huge. And I, w I wanted to get on the beach as soon as I could. 